Hello everyone, welcome to another video lecture in Art Appreciation. In this video, I'll talk about architecture. So before we proceed to the presentation of the different architectural structures in the Philippines and appreciating the beauty of architecture as a whole, allow me to provide first a definition for architecture. Architecture is the art of designing structures. So basically, when we talk about planning and designing different architectural structures, that is covered in architecture. Architecture comes from the Latin term architectura and ultimately from Greek architecton, meaning chief, builder, carpenter, and mason. So it has something to do with building structures. So if we are to study architecture, we also need to be acquainted with the different functions of the architect, the person who is the person or the professional who is primarily engaged in this study. So Fletcher, an author, gives a definite definition of the role of the architect. So an architect must be involved in construction, articulation, and aesthetics. Now, if we closely examine these three important functions of an architect, we would know that first, it is the primary responsibility of the architect to construct ideas for different structures. While there is a big difference between the functions of an architect and a civil engineer, both of them work hand in hand in constructing ideas and in making sure that these ideas are built to reality. Apart from construction, another role is articulation. Here, details that will be very useful in creating or constructing the ideas are considered. Articulation means adding details as well to the plan or the conceptualized idea for the structure. And then finally, the architect's responsibility is to make sure that there is also aesthetics. So make sure that there are interesting details included and that it is also physically or aesthetically appealing while not compromising the function, okay, the ergonomic or the physical function of an architectural structure. So there are three important theories of architecture that we need to know. First one is fermitas or durability. It should stand up robustly and remain in good condition. That is why when architects create plans for, for architectural structures, they make sure that it can withstand any natural calamity, most especially earthquake or fire. And they also follow certain protocols to make sure that, for example, a building or a structure is strong enough to withstand any calamity. For example, there is fire or there is an earthquake or even the possible withering because of the passing of time. And then second one, you have utilitas or utility. It should be useful and function well for the people using it. Of course, an architect will not make a structure if it's only for aesthetic purposes. It has to be purposeful. It has to be functional in that it has to be usable by the people. So utilitas or utility, this theory emphasizes that any architectural structure must still be able to perform its very function. And then lastly, we have beauty or venustas. It should delight people and raise their spirits, most especially when they use the architectural structure or when they utilize it for different functions. So even if it plays a function, the architect, architectural structure, it must still have that beauty or that aesthetic value. So again, the three theories of architecture are durability, utility, and beauty. This time, let's talk about a brief history of architecture in general. How did it start? And in what place did architecture really flourish? So let's talk about first Greek architecture. Architectural structures during this period are best seen on a hill, the Acropolis. Now, if we would notice, Greek architecture definitely is one of the remarkable architectural systems in the history. Why? Because of not only of the beauty of the architectural structures, but also of the tested durability of these structures. So if you notice, 
in the historical times, these architectural structures were widely used for different purposes, most especially for combats or warfare. And yet, despite the passing of time, up until now, we could still see some remains of these Greek architectural structures. So, when we talk about Greek architecture, it's also good that we acquaint ourselves with these three important concepts. And these are the three orders of columns of Greek architecture. So if you notice, most of the architectural structures in the Greek architecture have these columns. And they vary in terms of design and in terms of aesthetics. So if the column of a structure looks like this, then it is a Doric column. So if you notice, the capital is flat, and then it has also wide, this one, the trunk of the column itself, it is wide, and the capital looks like this. And then in Ionic column, the capital looks like this, and then this is the trunk of the column. And then for Corinthian, the capital is more detailed compared to the first two, the Doric and the Ionic, and it has a design like this. So at first look, you can already or clearly identify the difference or the distinction, distinction among these three orders of columns. So again, in Greek architecture, we have the Doric, we have the Ionic, and then we have the Corinthian. So these are the different parts, okay, or the different um, elements, compositional elements of the three orders. So we have the Doric order here, and then we have the Ionic order here, and then we have the Corinthian order. And you could see here some parts. Now, I will not discuss this in detail as all of us are not in, or most of us listening to this video are not in the field of architecture, but this is just for us to be knowledgeable, for us, for us to at least know some of the important parts of a column. Aside from Greek architecture, Roman architecture has also significantly influenced the modern architectural system that we have. So the Roman architecture was the first to use bricks and cement, which can be widely seen in their public buildings, for example, in their Colosseum, in their basilicas, such as Pantheon, you have the different arcs, the aqueducts, okay, the water structures, and the amphitheaters. So all of these architectural structures did use bricks and cement, and that is why these structures are considered strong despite the passing of time. And then we also have the Roman order of columns. So if in the Greek architecture, we have the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian, in the Roman order of columns, we have two only. And these are Tuscan and Composite. For the Tuscan, the capital, or the topmost portion of the column is actually Doric in appearance. So it has Doric capital with base and plane shaft. Okay? And then for composite, for the composite order, it's actually a combination of both the Ionic and the Corinthian. The capital looks like a combination of both Ionic and Corinthian with a base and fluted shaft. So one good example for Greek architecture or Roman architecture is the Alexander Column in Palace Square outside the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. So this one. Okay. The third type of architecture that has also influenced modern architecture is the Byzantine architecture. It is a typical feature found in practically all Byzantine churches. This was iconostasis and floor plan was based on the Greek cross. Their combination of the basilica in symmetrical central plan, usually circular or polygonal religious structures resulted in the characteristics of Byzantine Greek cross plan church with a square central mass in four arms of equal length. Now, usually when you go inside a Byzantine architectural structure, let's say a basilica okay, or a, a church, okay, usually one distinctive feature that it that you can automatically tell that it's a Byzantine architectural structure is the dome. Okay, if there is this dome, then most likely that's really Byzantine architecture because that's one of its distinctive features. It's the domed roof. So one good example for this is the Basilica Cistern in Istanbul. We also have the Romanesque architecture. This is an architectural style of medieval Europe characterized by semicircular arcs. 
So when there are semicircular arcs and let's say used in the windows or the entrances of the structures, then that's Romanesque architecture. So one good example for this is the west facade of the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Now, if you closely look at this structure, you can see here some semicircular arcs here in the windows and in the entrances. So that's one feature of a Romanesque architecture. And then we also have Gothic architecture. The Gothic architectural style in Europe actually lasted from the mid 12th century to the 16th century. Its masonry building is characterized by huge spaces with overlaid tracery of broken walls. Now, usually, these architectural structures are wide, okay, or have huge spaces, and oftentimes they have overlaid tracery of the of these broken walls. So one good picture for this is this one, this cathedral in France. And oftentimes, Goth architectural structures do have pointed roofs. Okay, this one. And then we also have the Renaissance architecture, the rebirth of the architectural system. So in this case, the European architecture of the period between the early 14th and early 16th centuries in different regions demonstrating a conscious revival and development of certain elements of ancient Greek and Roman thought and material culture. So before, we, we know that we had Greek and, uh, Greek and Roman architectural structures. And in the Renaissance period, there was rebirth, most especially of the Greek and the Roman architecture. And it was during the Renaissance period that Renaissance architecture was introduced, reviving certain elements found in the Greek and the Roman architecture, and then using some material culture as well. So this is an example, the Cathedral of Pienza. So this cathedral demonstrates one of the first true re Renaissance facades. So if you notice here, there are also arcs, there are also columns. Okay, so this is an example of Renaissance architecture. And then we also have the 19th century architecture. This time, there is use of new construction materials, hydraulic and steel cable elevators made higher structures possible, and concentration of business in urban areas resulted in higher codes. And in the 19th century architecture, the materials used in building these structures had become advanced. They had become more innovative. So new construction materials were used and the use of hydraulic and steel cable elevators was also evident. So one good example for this is the Statue of Liberty, New York Harbor, the world's most famous statue. So the building of it, most especially the texture, it has become a layering or there was lay layering. And the material, of course, used in this one is more innovative compared to the materials used, the traditional ones, the brick and the cement. Now, let's talk about the different types of architecture according to function. So first one is domestic. Okay? Domestic architectural structures are those that are intended for domestic purposes. Okay? Residential, commonly. So when you build domestic architectural structures, then basically it has to be in accordance to the daily needs of life. So it has to be comfortable enough and it highly depends also on the situation where the structure will be put up. Okay? So for example, if the structure will be built in, let's say, a mountainous area or in a rural area, then there could be certain specifications for that domestic architectural structure. As compared to those that will be built in, let's say, urban areas. So there are also differences. One good example for a domestic architectural structure is the Bahai Kubo, the traditional house made of hut or nipa in the Philippines. And then we also have recreational structures, those that are intended for recreation or entertainment. So good examples for this are coliseum, museums, and then we also have malls, parks, okay, structures like this. And then we have commercial, okay, commercial architectural structures, which are basically for business purposes. So here in the Philippines, we have various commercial architectural structures, such as malls. So in Davao City, we have 
the once famous NCCC Mall, where before it was caught on fire. And then also we have the famous architectural structures that are commercial in purpose, such as the SM Mall of Asia. And then we also have those that are religious in nature. So we have cathedrals and churches. We have actually a lot of traditional or historical churches across the Philippines, the Baraswain Church. And then here in Davao City, we have the San Pedro Cathedral, which has also unique architectural features. And then we also have those that are military or defense in purpose. So, for example, we have the United States, which established its first permanent military base in the heart of Israel. So, one common or distinctive feature of a structure, architectural structure for military and defense purposes, is its strategic positioning of different parts or different division, divisions or levels, if there are any. Why? Because it has to serve its purpose that it is for defense purposes and it is it has the primary function of defending whoever will be utilizing such an architectural structure then we of course we also have the factories definitely industrial in nature workers assemble vehicle um, transmission at the Toyota Auto Parts Philippines manufacturing plant in Santa Rosa Laguna as shown in the picture so Basically, that's it. That's my discussion for introduction to architecture. Again, this video lecture is just intended to give our gen ed students some insights as to how or what architecture is and how architecture evolved through times or through years and the different thoughts of architecture that influence the modern architecture that we have. And if we are to observe the different architectural structures in the contemporary or modern times, we would know that there are already a lot of changes, ranging from the materials used to the style to the aesthetics. Everything has changed already from the traditional materials or the traditional looks. Most, most of the traditional or ancient architectural structures basically had elements of Greek and Roman architecture. But now, if we notice, most are advanced 19th century architecture and modern architecture. So I think it's just that we need to open our eyes more to these kinds of architecture, both traditional and modern ones, for us to better appreciate how architecture evolved through times in the world. So basically, that's it. Thank you very much for watching this video discussion. And should you have any question regarding this brief introduction to architecture, please post them on the open forum. Thank you.